the the biggest misperception is like the story of Minneapolis is over. Like there was this moment, they tried to do something, they failed, it's over, right? Like, no, this is a long evolving process. Um, you know, I finished writing the book in 2023. Um, it already looks different. Now we're sitting in 2024. And um, every year that goes by, we should expect this continue to change and, and continue to feel the repercussions for both good and ill. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. This is the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. My guest today is Michelle Phelps, a sociology professor at the University of Minnesota, who has written a new book, Minneapolis Reckoning. I have it with me. I read it. It's it's good. Here it is. Uh, subtitle race violence and the politics of policing in America. I'm glad you, someone who lives in Minneapolis wrote this because there's a lot of smart, talented journalists from national outlets who come into Minneapolis and will write about our politics. And it's easy to mischaracterize people's motivations and uh, oversimplify what's happened. You didn't do that. Everything in this book rang true. Uh, I'm glad this book exists. So uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for writing this this book. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. It felt like um, an important story to tell. And as I talk about in the book, I, I didn't set out to write this book. It really, um, the book found me rather than the other way around. Yeah, so talk about how the project started and how it changed when George Floyd was killed. So the project started, I started thinking about it in 2016. I was on the heels of finishing another book, a much more academically oriented book called Breaking the Pendulum, The Long Struggle Over Criminal Justice. And that book really tried to argue that if you want to understand how criminal justice practices change, you have to understand who are the actors in local, state, and national contests, how are they understanding crime, and what do they think solves it. And so, of course, the BLM movement had exploded Black Lives Matter across the country um, at, by that point. And so we started to think in the conclusion of that book about what it would be, what, what it would mean to um, think about that theoretical framework, but think about policing instead of corrections. And what's different about policing is that it is local, right? So there's over 18,000 local police departments across the country. Cities like Minneapolis actually have multiple police departments, not just the one city police department. And so in 2017, I started a set of interviews. I was interviewing um, activists and organizers who were working around the question of policing and police violence, both inside and outside of city government, to try and understand how they made sense of that moment that we were in. Um, And I had a team of students who came to my office saying, you know, I want to do something around policing and police violence. And it was actually that team of students that started the project to look at... um, interviews with residents in North Minneapolis to understand how residents in the neighborhoods most impacted by police and community violence were understanding this moment. And so those projects, both of those interview projects, had wrapped up by 2019. um, And I had stopped the project. I was doing the analysis, but I was no longer collecting data. And it was... um, only after George Floyd was murdered that I realized that, um, I, first of all, I wanted to restart data collection, understand all of the complicated aftermath of the murder, and second, that all of the um, kind of information and experiences we gathered in those earlier years were sort of preamble to understand what happens in that moment. Uh, and my power congr- is going, going in and out. Sorry congratulations for holding your concentration as the lights in your home are flashing <laughs> uncontrollably. <laughs> <laughs> understand what's happening but i'm just gonna go in the dark we don't um this video never shows up anywhere right uh it's gonna go on youtube so it will show oh, up oh you people do do the your... videos on youtube okay most um, most people listen well i don't see. mind if you're in the dark i just hope your power stays on <laughs> so we too. can keep talking you talk about uh 
how policing is local. It's a local issue. And what draws me to local politics is a, it's a way to like break through the political party gridlock. Like you could do things, you could change a street, you can like rezone a city, but policing is so intractable as a local issue. It, people mention all these barriers, whether it's the state or federal government or the union contract, things never seem to go right. Tell us why this is different than other local issues. Yeah, well, policing is different for lots of reasons. I mean, I think policing, um, first of all, is a hyper local issue. So there's lots of other urban issues that are really tied to state and federal policy. So we think about, you know, like education as a local issue, but a lot of the funding and structure for education happens at the state level, you know, similar something like housing development, um, uh, cash assistance program. So policing is unique because it's one of the few forms of state intervention where the local politics drive 90% of the action. You know, and there's some state level, um, you know, we think about like the post board in Minnesota, which licenses police officers, or if we think about state laws around use of force, um, ditto at the federal level, but largely policing is under local control. Um, and, and I say local control with a little bit of hesitation um, only because there's so much activism and so much scholarship that shows that really we should understand it the other way around, right? That police have a stranglehold on local politics more than it's the case that local elected officials are really um, in charge of police departments. And part of that is about this kind of political power that police have. And part of it is just about the mundane, right? Police are one of the city services that we can't pause for a day, right? Cities are extremely dependent on their police officers going out and doing their job every day. And that means that um, police officers and their unions have a lot of political power. Well, you talk about why you started writing the book. Uh, friends, neighbors, daycare teachers asked me to make sense of the violence and what it would take to make it stop. This book is my attempt to answer that question. Uh, you also said, like, you hesitated. Like, does the world need a book on this topic from a white academic and so, like, uh, can you talk about those two things a little bit? So my hesitance around writing the book was really more in that 2019 period. And at that moment, there had been a couple of really good books that had come out on Black Lives Matter um, politics and kind of community receptions, both by black scholars. There's um, You Can't Stop the Revolution and Hands Up, Don't Shoot um, by Jennifer, uh, Jennifer um, Dungy and... Um, Andrea Boyles. And both of those books, I thought, really captured well both why people were out on the street, but also the really kind of complicated tensions between community and police violence with low income black communities in particular feeling this bind right between a rock and a hard place between police violence and community violence. And a lot of the data from the interviews in North Minneapolis, a lot of my interviews with activists, a lot of it was very resonant with those earlier studies, which had focused on, on places like Ferguson and places like Baltimore. And what changed in 2020 was obviously Minneapolis became kind of the epicenter of a new wave of um, unrest and a new story, a new chapter in the story of black freedom. And I think you know, before that, it had been a little bit hard to figure out how to characterize Minneapolis. You know, it is a majority white city. It is a progressive city or a city that understands itself as very progressive, although I talk a lot about the limits of that um, orientation um, in the book. But it wasn't it wasn't a Ferguson. It wasn't a Baltimore. And it was hard to understand. And it wasn't a mega city on the coast where there's a lot of scholarship. And so it was, it was a hard city to place. Right. Um, this predominantly white Midwestern city. And after 2020, first of all, the story wasn't just about sort of BLM movement activity, why people protested, how it was being perceived in the community. It was really a story about when you have this generation defining police murder, what comes in the wake of that, right? And in a city where elected officials at least explicitly promise to listen to black voices, what does that look like? And as a white scholar, it was important for me to think about all of the things that we had learned from, um, as a white scholar, sorry, uh, it was important for me to think about all that we'd learned from black scholarship, but it was also important to think about how whiteness and white politics 
drove the complexity of the reaction to George Floyd, right? That there was this moment nationally where you had over 50% of Americans saying they supported the Black Lives Matter movement for the first time, um, but also how brief that moment was and how much people tried to sort of isolate this particular murder from broader systemic issues in policing. So the ways in which this um, historic murder did and did not change city politics in a place that both understood itself as progressive and in a place that was majority white, um, that was a really interesting story to me. And I felt like that was a story that was different than the stories that had come before and something, um, as you said earlier, right, that the, the sort of story of Minneapolis and what happens after summer 2020 deserved to be told and told in a way that um, sat with all of the complexity of that story. A, a word you use constantly is ambivalence, the am, ambivalence of Minneapolis all, all over the book. And it's across racial groups. Uh, it's within uh, at certain ideologies, even within within groups. And uh, I think there's a whole book uh, that could be written about like uh, w the white backlash. <laughs> I've been going to neighborhood meetings a lot, uh, talking about local politics and watching it. And there was there really was no crime politics in Minneapolis, at least in the 2012 ish to 2020 era, where where after I moved here and started paying attention, uh, we didn't have crime. You didn't go to a neighborhood meeting and hear people clamoring for more police or more police funding really at least not in the in the south minneapolis neighborhoods where i'm going to neighborhood meetings i think it's a different dynamic in north minneapolis probably uh but that really changed like you introduce a little bit of fear into the equation for southwest minneapolis give them a little bit of taste of what maybe some neighborhoods in north minneapolis are facing and it changes everything. The dynamic really changes. And that remarkable unanimity right after George Floyd was killed, you mentioned there was that resolution. I went back and I read it. There's a lot of moments in the book where I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That happened. <laughs> and the, the language from that, I have it somewhere, but I might not be able to find it. It seems kind of radical looking back on it. And everyone, everyone on the council agreed to it. Everyone signed it. Uh, I don't know what my question is, but uh, can you find a question there? <laughs> sure. I mean, I think, you know, the so the question started off or the comment started off with a sort of uh, highlighting how much ambivalence plays a role in this book. And ambivalence, I think, I mean in lots of different ways. But one of the ways that I mean it is this tension between how do we solve police violence, but also community violence at the same time? And that was one of the things we were hearing from Northsiders in that 2017 to 2019 period was, you know, activists and city leaders are talking about police violence, but they're not talking about how they're going to solve community violence. And in fact, both face this really um, pervasive risk and they interact with one another, right? So if you are afraid to turn to the police, that is likely to make interpersonal violence dynamics worse. Um, and so... That ambivalence, I think, was really important to us to sit with and to, to sort of use that then as a lens to understand that's why we seem so unable to solve this problem, right? Is that we have these periods like summer 2020 where we're very focused on police violence and they are so quickly disrupted and punctured and turned into a new political dynamic when we are now concerned about the rise in crime, right? And when people are fearful of victimization. And so what happens in summer 2020 is this really um, powerful kind of polarization, right? And even sometimes within the minds of the same people, which is that if you sort of make them think about George Floyd, they go immediately to police as a form of danger, right? And what do we do about that danger? And then if you kind of um, prime them to think about what about, you know, you're getting carjacked in um, as you're driving through this city, right? Then suddenly police are there as the kind of protection. And what I argue in the book is that that ambivalence is structural and the communities that are most impacted are most impacted by both. And that that should give us a lens for thinking about what a like sustainable 
um, resolution to that ambivalence would look like. And part of that has to be you can't just address police violence. You have to address community violence simultaneously because efforts to address police violence that don't think about community violence are so, so vulnerable to that political reversal. And, you know, the pandemic in summer 2020 and then into 2021 we did see a real rise in particular kinds of violent crime, particularly homicides and particularly in North Minneapolis. Like that rise in people's fear levels um, wasn't just sort of manufactured by the media or people panicking. Like there was a real increase. We saw rates of homicide in the city um, that we hadn't seen since that peak in the 1990s when the city um, was nicknamed Murderapolis, although like partly just to sell T-shirts <laughs> as a sidebar. Um, but that was that was a real increase in people's victimizations. People in North, particularly, like felt that very acutely. They were tied to people um, and in networks that were experiencing that victimization. But that very real victimization switched a light on the politics, and it went from being community meetings about how do we draw, solve the problem of police violence to community meetings about how do we get more cops in the neighborhood. And at the same time, you really did have a shrinking of the department. It was never defunded. It was never dismantled by official policy. But officers were leaving in ways that left the department more than a third smaller than it was in May 2020. And so, you know, the department was under-resourced relative to what it was expected to do in the historical um, norms for the department. And certain forms of victimization were on the rise. And so it's, uh, it, it, it's understandable why people would turn to that, why aren't we being protected? But there was sort of an, a collective amnesia that that story about protection was really focused on how do we get the cops to protect us and not how do we solve the problem of victimization in the community at the same time that we address police violence and hold both those things in our minds. And I think the ambivalence is sort of the answer, like holding those things in our minds at the same time, I think is one of the few you know, guiding lights for the pathway forward. And I have the language here uh, and I'll read it so people can go back in time and see how unanimous feelings were at City Hall. Uh, Police violence, this is just a portion of it, police violence and the use of excessive force have led to community destabilization, a decrease in public safety, and the exacerbation of racial inequalities in Minneapolis, and concluded, no amount of reforms will prevent lethal violence and abuse by some members of the police department. I don't, I don't think, uh, without George Floyd's murder, I don't think Lisa Goodman would ever have signed on to something like that, for example. I think that's right. And I think the whole city was going through that, right? The whole city was trying to grapple with how do you how do you acknowledge the enormity of what just happened? And my worry is that with every day, every month, every year that passes, that sense of immediacy, it fades for people. And we can see that play out in our politics. I, what keeps me grounded is I constantly have to remind myself that like, the MPD exploded itself. Like it hasn't been denied money. The reason we are here today is because MPD has a long history of being a corrupt, dysfunctional, abusive institution. And uh, if anyone, any listeners need advice for how to like uh, resist the urge of fear politics. So uh, on that same theme, I think white white people in South Minneapolis, Southwest Minneapolis need to uh, maybe take a moment and have, I think this all the time, have some respect for abolitionists and defunders and all the people who were raising these issues at budget meetings, city council meetings for years before George Floyd was killed. Like it gets uh, turned into a slogan in the latest all of Minneapolis email blast a lot of times to, to punch at the activists but a lot of what they were proposing has come to be a mainstream position, and we would not be there if not for their work. People don't give them enough credit, right? Am I right? Yeah, I actually, I just had a, um, a piece come out in the New Republic, and the title is, The MPD is Dismantling Itself, and the uh, subtitle was, An Organizer Should Take Credit, which um, I didn't write either of those headlines, but I think accurately summarized the piece that I had written for them, which was about, I mean, I think, you know, the MPD is smaller today, and the MPD is smaller in part because activists have 
I think, really effectively changed the narrative around policing. And they have highlighted the kind of systemic injustices of policing um, and I, the, the kind of um, futility, although I don't fully agree with that, but the, I think that's certainly the language that they use, the sort of futility of police reform. Um, and, you know, the more, I think, um, maybe modest claim I make in the book is not that police reform is impossible, but the police reform can make at best kind of incremental improvements with heroic amounts of effort and is easily prone to backsliding. So I think this argument that our best, our best bet is to shrink the police and shrink their role and importantly, not just to leave communities to fend for themselves, but to build different kinds of public safety infrastructure. I think that argument is right. I think we wouldn't be having the conversation we're having now across the country about things like unarmed mental health response and about um, violence prevention work if it weren't for the work of organizers with groups like Reclaim the Block, MPD 150, Black Visions, um, who were seeding that ground years back, right, going back to 2017 with the MPD 150's report on the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, so they'd been they'd been tilling the ground for a long time. And what summer 2020 did was it was a catalyst that I think made those messages more resonant. And, um, you know, the the piece about white southwest Minneapolis is interesting. It just recently the police chief in Minneapolis was saying, you know, it's the people in South Minneapolis that are yelling at me to defund the police. And it's the people in North Minneapolis telling me how much they need our officers and essentially telling white activists to stand down. Um, and whenever I hear that discourse, there's always, I think, an erasure of the black activists who were leading a lot of this work first and foremost. Um, but second of all, you know, I think this idea that Southwest Minneapolis is like this like a hotbed of activism, you know, it is true that you have clusters of places, especially places with a lot of young people, where you do have um, white residents and activists who are calling for more transformational changes. But you also have the like neighborhoods around the lake down in the corner of Minneapolis. And it was those um, those precincts and that ward that were the most against question two to end the Minneapolis Police Department and create this Department of Public Safety. So you know, I think there's this narrative that it's white activists pushing this agenda. There's also a narrative that it's white Minneapolis that sunk question two. And I think it's both, right? I think white Americans and white Minneapolis residents, just like black residents, have really complicated um, perspectives on the MPD, even within individual people who are ambivalent, but also across the community. So you absolutely have activists that are white and um you know, very strong supporters of police abolition. You also have black activists who were leading the charge in a lot of those groups. Um, and you have white resistance. Like all of that is true simultaneously. Um, but I do think there is something, I, I do think, and, and you can get lost in these sort of politics of like, listen to black voices or listen to these voices. Like you're always choosing which voices to listen to. So the community is not a monolith. But I think when it comes to policing, because there's this bind between community safety and um, safety from police violence, I think listening to the communities that are most impacted by that bind is actually really important, right? And and I think a lot of a lot of the activists have much more thoughtful, nuanced takes on how to understand community violence than they're often given credit for in those kind of public conversations. But I do think there's a tendency to focus on the like get rid of the police or, or reduce funding for the police and less on what we're building. Um, you know, it was organizers and activists that were responsible for the beginning of the Office of Violence Prevention, um, which becomes the violence prevention work that expands in 2020. Um, currently unclear what's happening with that office as it sort of suffers from political infighting. But, you know, organizers were working to build up these alternative public safety models, but they haven't at the city level been given the sort of time and space and resources and planning that they need to really succeed. So you you mentioned it's not really a racial divide, it's generational. Like there are, there are black people, white people, people of color on both sides of this and that's not why uh, the charter amendment uh, w was going to succeed or fail. It was generational. Older people just were m more skeptical of this than younger people were. You talk to a lot of people with a lot of perspectives. 
And I just wonder, like, where do the reformers get their faith in reform? I am not an abolitionist. You write in the book that you are not, you can't get there either. But I, but I also, like, do not understand where reformers get their faith that the police in Minneapolis at least can be reformed. Like, we had uh, Fry saying no-knock warrants had been banned in... 2021 and then Amar Amir Locke was killed the next year shortly after the election uh, we had a uh, political leader saying the police union contract is the key to reform shortly after George Floyd was killed turned out uh, we we can't come to any kind of police contract that has reforms in it and they have downplayed it downplayed the significance since then uh, We've dissolved one sputtering civilian oversight board, replaced it with another one that is just as sputtering. Uh, coaching, which was said to have been ended for serious infractions as a way to like hide misconduct. Uh, we, they said that wasn't happening anymore. Still happening. That's a recent news story. And like, how, how much of that can we take? Like, I don't know where they get their faith in reform. I don't get it. Yeah. And, you know, I had to walk through all those examples in the book over and over and over again and through the different historical eras. Right. Um, and and that is the story. It is the story of two steps forward, one step back or less optimistically, one step forward, two steps back. Right. And it um, and it makes it hard to believe that reform is possible because there are so many entrenched barriers. I, you know, I struggled, I thought a lot in the book about kind of, do I quote unquote take a side and, and what does that look like? And for a while I wrote, you know, I'm a half abolitionist or it depends what day you ask me on. I think the, the final language I wound up with in the book is that I, um, I awkwardly straddle this reform abolition divide in a complicated way where I think a lot of people sit, you know, this sense that reform has failed over and over again. And also we need some form of state response, including like people paid by the city who are gonna respond when there are shootings who will have guns, right? And so what do you do with that tension? And I think, I think, you know, I wouldn't speak for them, but I think a lot of the folks who do this reform work I think that they believe that this is the, I, oh, I think there are folks that sort of cynically invoke reform to kind of push off attempts at deeper changes. I think that certainly happens. But I also think there are people who believe that reform of the department that exists in its current form is sort of our best step forward and that it's always going to be this halting piecemeal work that's never going to be done, but that it is doing the work that gives meaning, right? And it is like putting in that effort to make the the small incremental changes you can make in a current lifetime and hand the baton to the next generation of folks. Like that is the work. It is not that you are going to sort of fix policing. And you know, where I end in the book is you are never going to get to a place where police never kill folks. And in some cases, police killing residents of the city is seen as heroism, right? As we've seen very, very recently um, in the case of an active shooter, for example, that's seen as their job, right? And so you can't ever divorce violence from policing. Like that is the core of the law enforcement role. What you can do is try to put more constitutional um, and protective barriers around like what is justified and unjustified force. And part of the work I think the reformers are doing is trying to force a public conversation about we as a public elect these officials, we as a public are sort of responsible for the democracy, what do we see as justified and unjustified? And I think if you start there, actually, you see the root of it very quickly, which is like the public doesn't actually agree on what good violence looks like and what bad violence looks like in policing. And so I think reformers are doing their best to push the boulder up the hill. Um, and I think it is a, a thankless task. But I do think I think the answer forward is that there have to be people who are working on different kinds of public safety models, small to big. I think there have to be work people working on police oversight and accountability. Um, 
And we will just need both of those streams of action. I would rather a world in which there continue to be groups that are, for instance, pushing on the coaching issue than a world in which those groups don't exist and we just accept the status quo. Right. People think of the 2020 city council as this radical abolitionist group of politicians. And that's not how I see it. I see them as like regular progressive, many of them white urban progressives who like had had it like they had seen it up close and pledging to end MPD as an institution wasn't really a maybe an abolitionist exercise it was just like a practical like we can't do it anymore with these people we have to end it and figure something else out and uh, I think that gets lost a lot. Like we have a much more further left city council than we did during that time. What that's right. Think? And that's quite recent. I mean, I don't I, you know, uh, because of the wonky election cycles, that wasn't true um, in that intervening period. But it certainly is now. And yeah, I mean, I think. And, and you could see the, again, ambivalence of the council, I think, in the interviews they gave almost immediately after the Powderhorn Declaration. I mean, there's a reason that they chose the language of dismantle this police department and not abolish the police, right? Because I think a lot of them saw the Powderhorn Declaration as a route to what they understood as transformational police reform, including like reconstituting a new police department um, that would essentially allow them to break the power of the union, of the officers union. There were other folks on council that I think had more of a kind of background in organizing and more of a sense of what they wanted. You know, you had folks like um, Felipe Cunningham that very much took a more kind of public health oriented approach. So, you know, I think the people on that stage, and it's important to remember, right, it was just nine that took to the stage. Um, It wasn't the full group who winds up passing that um, unanimous document. Um, the folks on the stage, I think, had really different ideas about what it is that they were promising to do and why they were doing it. And the most interesting person on the stage to me is Andrea Jenkins, who, you know, as a black trans woman, knew intimately, right, the costs of police violence, but also, you know, the costs of violence in the community and has had been a real swing vote on a lot of these issues, kind of sitting right at the center of the council in an interesting way and continued to do so and then became chair. Um, and I think I like she's sitting on the stage and talking to the talking to the audience and talking to a reporter and a reporter says, well, are you sure about this? Essentially asking her about ambivalence, right? And, and um, council member Jenkins says, it's possible to be conflicted and still understand that this is doing the right thing. That's a paraphrase, but essentially that. And, and I think that's exactly right. There was a, people were, were traumatized by the murder. Um, they had been through this intense period of mobilization, including cemeteries on their house and activists calling them out at their homes. Um, there was intense pressure on them. And they had felt a sense of like, what have we done as a council in these years to address police violence? Um, and I think there was really a sort of desire to do something big and to do something new. And I think the, the challenge was they both in that statement tried to say, we're going to dismantle the police department, we're going to end it. But then they also said, we're going to do a year of community engagement and sort of figure out, or that's what comes out of it is this year of community engagement. And there was no promises of sort of what would look like next. And so, you know, I think it should have been predictable from the moment they were on that stage, number one, that the council couldn't actually do this over the mayor's opposition without going through the vote. But second, that they needed to figure out sort of what the game plan was to get public buy-in. And that was always going to be difficult because they wanted to turn to the community first. So it's this really weird statement. It's this, we're going to do something radically different. We don't know what that is. And we're going to turn to you, um, which, you know, I think in a context in which the city had just been through this mass unrest makes a lot of sense why they did that, but it also makes sense the sort of backlash that that got both locally and nationally. There's an interesting little uh, storyline you include, I'm glad you included it, about Philippe Cunningham trying to like flesh out what question two might actually be in reality. And like this, the 
cities, city attorneys are like, no, you can't legally do that. You have to leave it very vague because using city resources to flesh out this would be playing politics. <laughs> I was watching that city council meeting on Zoom, you know, I was in my living room, it was the pandemic, and um, I was just flabbergasted, right, that you were going to create, like, people wanted a plan, you know, it was, um, famously, the chief would go on to say, I'd take a drawing on a napkin at this point, but city council wasn't able to put together the drafts of those ordinances and such that would have fleshed out a plan, and so, you know, I think it was right to say by the time that we get to the November 2021 vote that we didn't know as, a, as city residents what exactly it was going to do. And, and that was in part because the city council members who were pushing it forward, their hands were tied on this implementation. I think it's also true that it was ambiguous in part because the question two folks were trying to thread together this really complicated coalition of people who wanted full abolition and people who wanted something that looked more like big reforms. Um, and so that ambiguity of the Powderhorn statement, even though we could think that ambiguity was a moment of a sort of like urgency of the moment, well, but even by the time we get to the November 2021 election, there's still that ambiguity about what the proposal is actually going to do. And some of that was because they couldn't plan, but some of that was about sort of bringing in a bunch of different constituents who, again, like the council um, nine, had different ideas about what a future with question two might look like. Um, and so that left them open to these charges um, that there wasn't a plan. And then you get this like m funky um, messaging, right? Where you have campaign spokesperson saying, this is not about defunding. This is not about abolishing the police. This is about expanded public safety. But then you also have other organizers who are saying, no, no, this is our plan to abolish the police. And you have that tortured language in the draft of the proposal that says it may include licensed peace officers if necessary, um, which was sort of the most explicit nod to this really complex coalition. It was a total blank canvas. Uh, it was like, OK, you are allowed to do these things now. You reduce the officer minimum. You could have more officers than we had in the past. You could fund police higher. And uh, what happened is people ended up painting their worst fears uh, the opponents did on that. So I started reading the book beef, like as P Minneapolis was commemorating the death of George Floyd in late May. And I was still reading the book uh, last Thursday when Jamal officer Jamal Mitchell was killed late May. Uh, it's had a big impact on the city's politics already. And I wonder, like, what, what was running through your mind? You must have been thinking some things. You wrote this whole book. So what was running through your mind when that happened? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it, in, in, a, in a funny way, it felt a lot like um, that day in May in 2020 of just a sense of, this is coming for us as a city and we're not ready for what's about to hit us. We're not ready for all of the complicated aftermath of the trauma of this, right? In the case of George Floyd, it was the community's trauma on um, the kind of seemingly um, indifference of this officer kneeling on his neck. In this case, right, it's the police officer's response to losing one of their own. And you know, this idea of officer safety um, is so animating, uh, so animates police training and police practices. There's two um, great books that just came out, The Danger Imperative and um, Before the Badge, that both talk about how officer safety and concerns about officer safety drive a lot of the violence that we see in communities, right? When officers interact with community members scared that they're going to be attacked or shot, they're much more likely to be aggressive with people and community members. They're much more likely not to trust people. They're much more likely to shout and pull their weapons. And, you know, a lot of times those interactions will end with nobody harmed in a physical way. And police officers will say, well, see, there we, we did that stop safely, right? I patted that person down to make sure that they weren't armed. I pulled my weapon when there was a moment where their hand was in their, um, you know, in their belt and I wasn't sure what they were going for. And so, look, I kept myself safe and this person is safe. So that was a, a victory here. 
Um, whereas the person who just had a gun pulled on them, right, who may have been subject to a really invasive pat down in the middle of public for, you know, for all we know, doing nothing wrong and having no reason to have come under police scrutiny, that was not a everything ended fine interaction for this person, right? That was a traumatic experience in some cases for that person. And so, you know, when I heard the news, obviously my heart went out to the, you know, the officer's family and folks who knew him. But I also worried about what it would mean for the city and what it would mean in a context where police have been claiming, I think unfairly in many cases, that they are under attack and um, that there has been a lack of support provided to them, even though the funding has, you know, if anything, gone up in Minneapolis. Um, and if we think back to, um, you know, several historical cases of police officers being shot and killed on the job. So this hasn't happened in more than 20 years in Minneapolis. Um, the most famous case is uh, Jerry Hoff, who was killed in the mid-90s, and that was used relentlessly by officers and their federation to argue for more aggressive police tactics for more police. So I do, I do worry about kind of the, um, this quote-unquote war on cops narrative and how that will further push us into these kind of retrenchment politics. Yeah, the chief was on TV recently comparing anti-police rhetoric to like hate crimes <laughs> and religious religious hate. It's like maybe you're going too far there, Chief O'Hara. I generally like him, but like he gets into playing politics on TV more frequently the longer he's here and I cringe at it. It's very painful. Yeah, I I recently uh, wrote a letter to the editor at Harper's to respond to a different set of very public statements from the chief, and um, I too feel like he um, he is sort of retreating into a sense of being politically under siege in a way that is um, disconnecting him from I think a more nuanced perspective on some of these questions that I would have rather seen, and that I think we saw with Chief Arredondo at least before summer 2020. I mean, I think after summer 2020, um, there was such a sense of sort of pushback against the department that I think a lot of folks who previously you could have more nuanced conversations with took a much harder line after that moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, police officers, just to put it bluntly, I mean, it's a profession. <laughs> it is not a protected category in the way of um, religion, say. And I think it's really important to remember when police officers face political pushback, they are often facing political pushback because of violence that police have enacted in the community, right? So there's this weird kind of like starting the political clock with the unrest after the murder of George Floyd and blaming things in the city on the unrest rather than blaming the murder itself, right, as the kind of origin point. Um, and so, you know, my worry is that if police then go into neighborhoods with this kind of, we gotta like knock some skulls kind of mentality, that that in fact not only makes residents less safe, but it makes police officers less safe, right? Like um, you, can't, you can't bully your way into public respect, they have to earn it. And I understand that there are sort of systematic challenges with officer um, uh, staffing numbers, for instance, but that is not because of a lack of funding from the city. And so I do, um, yeah, I, I, do, I do worry about how the kind of initial kind of um, political fallout of this has played out. And, you know, you saw that, too, with the county attorney um, dropping criminal charges against a state trooper, which, you know, the statement on that started with um, mourning the loss of the officer. Um, and so I, it does feel like a sort of shift in the political winds in a way that could make it difficult to do the work of addressing police violence. Yeah, we tend to people tend to make it about like the personal qualities of individual police officers like Jamal Mitchell appears to have been a good person, a good officer, well, well loved. And Derek Chauvin was just a really, really bad guy and kind of leave it at that. And maybe it's more complicated than that. I think that makes this moment even more challenging, you know, that Officer Mitchell was by all accounts, you know, and, and news on this is, is still coming out, but by all accounts, you know, he was the kind of officer that we'd want to see at a place like MPD. And I think that makes the loss um, especially hard in this moment. 
um, because of that. But when we talk about the violence of policing, it is about the violence of policing as an institution. It's not about those individual officers. Um, and I think there's this misperception that when people critique the institution of policing, they are denying the heroism of individual officers. But there's nothing that that there's nothing that says that you can't believe simultaneously, as I do, that there are some officers and some people in all kinds of professions that perform incredible acts of heroism on the job, and also that policing systematically has these violent, um, negative interactions for and consequences for communities. Like those two things can be compatible in our minds. I remember years ago, there was an officer who I won't name, but who I'd, I'd had a relationship with. And um, like uh, we were <laughs> collegial, not a relationship relationship. Um, and I had had him come into my class a couple of times and do like guest Q and A's with my students. And uh, one of the things this officer said was, um, I don't ever give out speeding tickets because I speed all the time. And I think that would be hypocritical of me. <laughs> And we're thinking like, OK, but, you know, if you think it's hypocritical for police to issue citations and <laughs> tickets for speeding, all of your other officers <laughs> or many of them are doing that. Right. This is a systemic problem that you can't just solve with your one individual act and your um, individual resistance. Yeah, not not doing things because you identify with the the people you're enforcing the law against is a slippery slope <laughs> to some bad <laughs> things. Uh, are there things people get wrong about this era of police politics in Minneapolis? So you're like, I have to set this straight with, with the book. If people are getting this wrong. I need to set it straight. You know, I think we've already talked about the big one, which is, you know, the city did not promise to abolish the police department. And I think what that initial statement at Powderhorn Park meant could be interpreted in lots of different ways and meant different things to different people who were on that stage. The reverse is true, too, right? That question two doesn't pass in November 2021. And the kind of media narrative is defund is a failure. We've already talked about why that isn't the case and some of the surprising victories of the defund um, slogan and campaigns and movement organizing. Um, but it's also just not the case that nothing changed on the ground, right? The police department was much smaller afterwards. There were these new alternative models of public safety that, again, are being built up in fits and starts that aren't as big as the MPD that are subject to um, a lot of political infighting and scrutiny right now. Um, but those things matter, right? And, and we should have always expected that the work, you know, if we think about the murder of George Floyd as a consequence of generations of failure at the local, state, and federal levels, like failures to intervene in structural racism in lots of different ways, failures to um, reform and provide oversight for the MPD, failures to address residential inequality and racial segregation, right? If we think about it as generational failure, then we should never expect that the answer was going to be done on the order of magnitude of months or years, right? And so I think people, the, the biggest misperception is like the story of Minneapolis is over. Like there was this moment, they tried to do something, they failed, it's over, right? Like, no, this is a long evolving process. Um, you know, I finished writing the book in 2023. Um, it already looks different. Now we're sitting in 2024. And um, every year that goes by, we should expect this continue to change and, and continue to feel the repercussions for both good and ill. So I, you mentioned at the end of the book the, a thought experiment about what would be different if the Charter Amendment had passed. And uh, I do that all the time. I think about that. And I, because I'm a negative person, I think about all the ways in which our politics would be worse. Like every shooting, every murder that had happened even when blamed question on it. two was defeated, it would be mm -hmm. blamed on mm -hmm. question two. All the things that were just bound to happen the officer staffing chart like cratering still on the downslope that would be blamed on question two i don't know what we blame it on uh, now that question two has de been defeated for three years now or almost three years so uh that's what i think of that thought experiment <laughs> that's right and i think organizers would have been able to claim a more explicit victory here but i think that would have been a very short-lived victory and you know, I don't think um, 
I think the, the, the idea that organizers were pushing for, which is that we ask too much of police and how do we figure out how do we diversify emergency response, but also preventative measures like that, I think, is actually the right answer. And I think when cities have a public safety emergency and they have therapists at the table, they have people deep in violence interruption work in the community at the table, when they have these other professional identities and public safety isn't all about law enforcement, like, I think that is actually the right idea. Um, and so in that sense, I was very much um, in favor of the Charter Amendment. But in practice, the way it was written, the way that it would have been received, what was happening in the city, we weren't ready to, as a city, to stand it up and to staff it in the way that you would have needed to overnight because of the political challenges that it faced, right? And in a, in a context in which the chief was against it, the rank and file was against it, the resistance that it would have faced would have just been um, overwhelming. And so I think like that is actually the vision of where we want to go, but but it has to. But we have to think about the planning process, and the planning process is not just the ordinances and so forth that they didn't have a chance to flesh out, but real in the weeds. Like, what exactly is the violence interruption model we're trying to pursue? How do we train people to do it? How do we oversee them? Is there a system of accreditation? Should there be licensing boards? What does misconduct review look like and what constitutes misconduct, right? Like what kinds of, how many alternative responder teams can we have? You know, in those early question two flyers, there were those diagrams that were like, if a person is having a mental health problem, they'll get a mental health response. And if the person is in the throes of drug addiction, they'll get an addiction counselor. Like, but really doing that planning work and not just the sort of what does it look like to implement it, but who are the people who are going into all of these jobs? I mean, the thing that I would love to see come out of summer 2020 is that we have a whole generation of young people who are radicalized by this moment who want to figure out how do they find career paths where the, that's the kind of work that they can do. And we figure out how to create training and accreditation and accountability processes to make all those different public safety pathways happen um, for that new generation of folks and for the people in community who need those services. Um, and so like, that's what I'd like to see come out of this. Yeah, because the it doesn't seem like people want to be cops uh, right. as much anymore. And so we're gonna need people to fill different kinds of public safety roles to pick up the slack. I and I keep saying that to reporters, you know, I keep getting these calls from reporters asking me to, you know, really finally parse the evidence on do police reduce crime? What do we mean by crime? How do we measure it? Like, what is the impact? And the thing I keep saying to them is, look, I can I can finally parse that literature for you, which is complicated, um, but there's a lot of it. Um, but at the end of the day, it sort of doesn't matter, at least um, in Minneapolis, it doesn't matter whether we think more cops is a good thing or a bad thing. And I don't think we as a city have any kind of consensus on that. But it's sort of a moot point because we don't have the people applying to do it. And so, you know, I think that's creating a sense of emergency for the MPD um, for understandable reasons. But it's also an opportunity. Like we have to be experimenting in this space. We have to figure out how to dispatch more of those calls and how to prevent more of those calls in the first place, because this is an unsustainable um, status quo. But the but the answer isn't to keep like to badger people to become police officers. That's not going to work. It has to be about how do we how do we work around what is a new political reality? So I could keep you here all day, but I, I can't do that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to end it. The book is The Minneapolis Reckoning, Race, Violence, and the Politics of Policing in America. It gets the Wedge Live seal of approval. It's it's a true story told uh, accurately, in my view, as somebody who watched closely. I think even if you pay close attention to Minneapolis politics, you'll, you'll find a lot uh, in the book. Thank you, Michelle Phelps. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. And um, it's great to hear from people who were paying so much attention in those moments that they're is new material here, but also useful to have somebody to have collated and brought it all together. I think a lot of us actually could have written pieces of this book, um, and I'm glad we have the record. This has been the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. Thank you for listening. This is a real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. I have nothing else going on.
going on today? We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.